Hello everyone and welcome to Cine 103, History Motion Pictures from the beginning to 1945 and this is class 7 and I am Professor Dave Eccles. Today we're going to talk about the Depression, Clark Gable, Gene Harlow, Frank Capra, and the Thin Man as well. And a lot of this is going to come uh, dovetailing off of the uh, the censorship and the Hayes, Hayes office and the Hayes code and we're gonna look at a little bit of pre-code material from Gene Harlow and Clark Gable. All right, let's get started. First up, Clark Gable, the king. It was his nickname probably by a press agent at MGM, something like that, back in uh, the golden era of Hollywood in the 30s and 40s, big stars like Clark Gable would have their own personal uh, press agents and people like that. They would have some for the entire studio, but big stars like Clark Gable and Gene Harlow, they would have uh, personal press agents assigned to them to manage their careers and leak things to the press, the gossip press, and where was Clark seen last night at what restaurant and things like that. <clears throat> He made four films with Gene Harlow, Red Dust, China Seas, Saratoga. And we're going to be looking at some of Red Dust, a notorious pre-code film. And it takes place in Indochina, as it was called back then. And that would be Vietnam. And uh, Clark is working on a rubber plantation and uh, he has to battle with tigers and things like that. And uh, up on the boat from, say, I think they call it Saigon instead of Saigon in the, in the movie. And uh, up comes this girl here, uh, Jean Harlow. And there are enough hints that we can tell that she is a prostitute, a woman of the evening. A woman of ill repute. Lots of, uh, lots of different ways uh, to say that. She mentions at one point in the film, I'm used to working nights. And um, there are a few other clues. Uh, some of the clothes that she wears are rather sexy and flimsy and so on. And uh, most, uh, most women probably wouldn't be wearing that sort of thing. Uh, and she's traveling alone. Uh, she mentions, I got into a little trouble uh, back in Saigon, and I thought it would be best if I got out, uh, with the gendarmes. I thought it would be better if I got out of got out of town for a little while. So she hops on a riverboat and uh, goes up the river and uh, and gets off at uh, the Clark Gable is managing this uh, rubber tree plantation. <clears throat> And uh, so there is a notorious scene with Jean Harlow uh, and Gable, and she's uh, taking a bath in a rain barrel. Uh, you'll see it. She's taking a bath in a rain barrel. And uh, he comes along and, and uh, says, I thought I told you to, you know, pull down the shades when everybody, when people are around. And she says, they're all off at work. And then she mentions another woman who is there at the at the plantation. And she's married uh, to a surveyor, and uh, he is away. So uh, we kind of get a love triangle there with uh, Gable's character. And uh, the other woman uh, is married and, and clearly not a prostitute and a little bit uh, different than the Jean Harlow character, although uh, Jean's character is... Uh, certainly a lot more earthy and probably more truthful about the whole thing. She's not sleeping around on a husband, that's for sure. So Gable uh, is standing there, and from his angle, he probably can see most of everything from Jean Harlow's character, who's in the rain barrel there, and she jumps into she jumps into the water supply and so on and frolics around. So this is notoriously pre-code stuff and any book and any uh, online compilation of pre-code things and all that, Red Dust is always 
uh, is always there. It's always a, a part of all that. And Jean uh, ended up playing some of these kinds of women in uh, multiple movies. She was young and very pretty. And um, luckily for her, uh, she didn't seem to have uh, some of the personal problems, uh, the mental problems, neuroses that Clara Bow had and Marilyn Monroe and some of the other uh, women in Hollywood noted uh, mostly for their looks uh, rather than their brains, I guess you might say. And uh, Jean in person was very nice. I hate to call it normal, but um, she wasn't a party girl. She didn't find a need to go out to nightclubs all the time. Uh, she liked the idea of just getting married and having kids and maybe knitting and, and that sort of thing. She wasn't a diva. And uh, she uh, knew most of the names of the uh, people on the set, uh, the, uh, the uh, lighting people and the camera people and the set people and the makeup people. Uh, she knew them all by name and, and uh, uh, she was very friendly. Like I say, she wasn't much of a diva or anything like that. Uh, the way that uh, some other uh, uh, movie stars uh, could be. So um, she was uh, uh, very well liked, very well liked around MGM. They both worked at MGM. That was the biggest studio. And so uh, MGM paired them up in a number of films. So Jean Harlow, we've been talking about her a little bit. The Blonde Bombshell was the nickname that she got from a press agent. This is a shot from Dinner at Eight and uh, a, another fantastic movie uh, that uh, she made here. She's playing kind of a trophy wife. Uh, she's married to a gruff business industrialist. Um, and he is played by Wallace Beery, fantastic Wallace Beery, good actor, comic actor, and so on. And uh, she is clearly... Um, I don't know, maybe she was a waitress, maybe she was a showgirl. Uh, I don't know that they really say where, where she came from, but uh, she's not a society girl or anything like that. And uh, her bedroom is way over the top, whoever did the design work and the decorating uh, at MGM. Uh, they really went way over the top, her the giant bed and all these furs and things. And, and uh, uh, it's all, you know, including her hair. The platinum blonde was a Another word uh, used for her, her hair was, you know, blonde, so blonde it was just about white, I guess. Um, and uh, it photographs quite nicely in black and white films, but here we see her uh, and her blonde hair and the, and the, and the uh, chair, I guess that is, and, uh, and the carpeting and all that, and very lavish and very lush and, and kind of over the top. So uh, she's a trophy wife in Dinner at Eight. Uh, there's another another term. A woman of easy virtue uh, is another term for prostitute. And of course, uh, even before the even before the Hayes Code was strictly enforced, uh, discussing you know prostitutes and that sort of thing was still um, something that Hollywood didn't do. Uh, they they toned it down after the Hayes Code started being enforced in 1934. But even before then, during the pre-code era, uh, it still was, was downplayed. America was a different place back in the early 30s. Uh, but when the Hayes Code came in, they, um, they really t they toned it down even more so. Let's just say they, they toned it down even more so. Um, so uh, she's uh, kind of, she and, and Beery are the comedic relief in the movie Dinner at Eight. Uh, there's um, one of the big MGM all-star cast type movies. They got a lot of their big stars uh, from from the studio at that time, uh, and um, including a couple of the Barrymores, uh, Gene Barry, Joan Crawford, people like that. It was a it was a big old all-star cast, and they did a couple of uh, movies like that. Uh, those kind of movies became kind of a thing in uh, the 1970s to uh, big all-star casts and things like that. So uh, there are, there's drama for sure in the movie uh, and uh, people may be going bankrupt and maybe dying and maybe suicidal and all of that. But in the movie, 
uh, uh, Gene and Wallace Beery are a little bit more of the comedic relief uh, in the film. So during the Depression, and we're going to spend some time on the Depression, the next few classes, uh, the rich are often portrayed as out of touch and kind of clueless and maybe frivolous, as we see here Jean's character. At one point, her husband's going to say, I'm meeting with the president, and I'm going to help him out with the economy. And this is, you know, 1930s, right? The depths of the Depression, 1933. And she says, oh, what's, what's the matter with it, right? What's the matter with the country? What's a, and so, you know, now that she's his wife and living quite the high life with the beautiful designer uh, clothes and she sits, lazes around in bed eating chocolates all day and has a personal maid and all that sort of thing. And so she's, she's out of touch, but even others uh, that we will see in the movies, uh, including It Happened One Night, from Frank Capra, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. And also, uh, completely out of touch, uh, not used to riding public transportation like buses and things like that, and being pampered, uh, and so on. And so, they're not really seen, the rich aren't really seen as evil uh, very much. And remember, the people that were making these movies were rich. Uh, Louis B. Mayer, the head of MGM and these other uh, studios, uh, Jack Warner, and you know, they're, they all lived in nice houses in Beverly Hills and places like that. So uh, they got it. They knew where the public was coming from in uh, the Depression, and they knew a lot of people were out of work. They, they you know, read the newspapers and saw the newsreels and everything. Uh, but they knew that the vast majority of their, of their uh, ticket-buying public was... Uh, not all that happy with possibly the way the rich uh, were. And so they treated them as, again, kind of silly, out of touch, clueless, frivolous, but not really evil or mean. A couple of movies, they're, they're kind of evil and mean, but it's not the general way that they were portrayed. A little bit more like Jean is in this movie and Claudette Colbert in It Happened One Night, m more clueless than, than anything else. And so, uh, as kind of a shorthand for portraying rich women, uh, often we get fur coats and diamonds. That's really the thing, furs and diamonds. And uh, I can't tell, uh, I don't, I'm not seeing diamonds, but often we will see lots of diamonds and things on women. Men, um, a little harder to do, unless it's formal. A lot of times rich men would be in formal wear, wearing maybe a top hat, and a tuxedo and a cane and that sort of thing. So that's the way men might be portrayed. But again, there has to be an occasion for men to dress like that. Whereas for women, uh, furs and diamonds it can be kind of everyday wear. And there we see Jean died, shockingly, in 1937 at 26. Pretty young, really at the peak of her uh, career. Uh, she had a, a number of years left for sure. And like Marilyn Monroe and other women in Hollywood, there is a kind of a double standard, uh, and we'll talk about that, I think, through the semester. Men are romantic partners in their 20s and 30s and can be in their 40s and 50s as well. All we have to do is look at uh, today people, uh, you know, uh, 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 Brad Pitt's in his 50s and Tom Cruise is in his 50s and Johnny Depp is in his 50s. And, um, and they're still, you know, the leading man, right? And they would have, uh, uh, you know, uh, girlfriends and, and whatever and, and all of that. Whereas women, the double standard is that a, a lot of times when they hit 30 or somewhere in their mid-30s, uh, then they're not really uh, the woman that is uh, the romantic partner. Uh, at a certain point, women would have to start playing mothers, and things like that, and, and uh, some like Garbo, Greta Garbo said that she wouldn't play mothers, right? What, when she wasn't uh, the romantic side of the, of the story, then she didn't really wanna transition her career into playing uh, uh, wives and mothers and that sort of thing, especially mothers. Being a wife is one thing, but being a mother for some actresses, not something they wanted to do. So she died at 26. Um, and so not really at the, uh, at the end of her career, 
Uh, Marilyn Monroe was 37, I believe, and that might have been, you know, unless she could transition to other kinds of parts. When Marilyn Monroe died in 1962, she was in her later 30s, and she might have been toward the end of her career. Uh, Jean still had uh, a way to go for sure, uh, and she died of, um, I think it was sepsis, uh, but internal uh internal um, problems, the sort of uh, blood poisoning and that sort of thing that they probably could cure today uh, with modern medicine and so on. She wasn't in a car crash. She didn't commit suicide. It wasn't anything like that. Uh, it was the sort of thing uh, like Valentino uh, that we talked about before and a few other people that probably modern medicine could have saved her. Uh, but it wasn't anything, it was shocking for sure, but it wasn't anything dramatic like uh, like a murder or a suicide or, or something like that. So enjoy uh, the clips from Jean Harlow. Uh, and there's sort of a through line in Hollywood when there are documentaries and things about what they would call sex stars in Hollywood as opposed to uh, uh, female stars. Uh, but going back to Clara Bow, um, Greta Garbo, through Jean Harlow, and on the way to Marilyn Monroe, and so on. So she's kind of on that uh, time, on that uh, through line. And uh, yeah, it's very shocking at, uh, at uh, 26, and I'm sure she would have been paired up with Clark Gable uh, a number of uh, more times uh, to make more movies. The ones they made together were, were, always, uh, were always quite successful. And they're, they're a good team. Uh, I don't know if personally, if they enjoyed each other's company off the set, but uh, Jean made friends easily. Everybody loved her. She was a really uh, down-to-earth sort of a person, and like I say, not not a diva the way Garbo was, or Crawford, or uh, Gloria Swanson, or people like that. So big loss uh, for Jean Harlow. So we're going to go back to Clark Gable and a film he made with Frank Capra. Frank Capra, director, uh, from uh, Italy, came over as a child. Uh, I don't hear an accent in his voice when, when I hear him talk, so he must have come over early enough that uh, it, it, he didn't uh, stick with his uh, Sicilian or Italian accent. I think he was a child. Anyway, his movies uh, center around a simple man, sometimes they called the common man, um, often trying to fight corruption in society. Not always, not always, but often trying to correct, fight corruption in society. Um, and Capra won three directing Oscars, and uh, that's a lot. Only John Ford has four, and today uh, no one has more than two. Spielberg has two, um, Oliver Stone has two, uh, uh, Ang Lee has two, so there's a few directors with two. But nobody has three or four uh, that are directing today. And a little bit like Charlie Chaplin, uh, Capra would put in that little bit of sentimentalism, okay, a little bit of, of sentiment. And Chaplin uh, did that really all the way through. That I think that's part of what made him such a big star. And I would say today that Pixar, for sure, and Disney, um, very much so. Very much so. They love a little bit of, maybe get you a little misty-eyed, uh, something like that. Something, um, you know, thinking about, um, uh, think of Toy Story and uh, youth and uh, things. Uh, Disney often has, uh, you know, um, orphan kids and things like that in a number of their uh, movies. Pixar, for sure, uh, they love to maybe get you a little misty-eyed. There's comedy there, for sure. Uh, but uh, they're full of sentiment. And that goes back to Chaplin, and that goes through uh, Frank Capra. Some people call it Capra corn, corny. Some people say that it's kind of corny, uh, trying to um, uh, jerk people's sentiments around and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, he was immensely popular. Uh, his movies always did very well at the box office, and, and, uh, uh, and he was... Uh, Revered in the community, three Oscars, that's, that's pretty good. So some of Capra's uh, films, you might have heard of uh, 
It's a Wonderful Life or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Those are the two that most people seem to know. It's a Wonderful Life is the movie. Uh, Jimmy Stewart is uh, a family man. He's got a wife and two or three kids, and uh, he runs a he runs a uh, savings and loan, I think it is, and uh, a large amount of money is lost, and he's feeling suicidal. He's feeling that his insurance is worth more than he he's worth more dead than alive is the, is what he comes to and he's going to jump off a bridge and into the icy river and commit suicide so it's kind of a dark movie right at christmas time too it's a very dark movie uh but the angel clarence appears and uh and, and he um they have a conversation actually the angel clarence jumps in the river first and jimmy stewart's character jumps in and saves him and he mentions that uh, you know, um, possibly uh, uh, more worth more dead than alive, and I wish I'd never been born. And so the angel Clarence shows him what the town would have been like, and his brother and his wife, and what the town would have been like if he'd never been born. Uh, and that's a that's a wonderful uh, fantasy. Again, it's a wonderful life. Uh, a big time Christmas movie before. Uh, Christmas Story came along with uh, with uh, Little Ralphie and his BB gun and so on. It's a Wonderful Life was one of the big movies that everybody watched around Christmas time, um, and it's it's uh, it's kind of depressing for a while. The poor guy, you know, he just wants to get out of town and all that, but it has such a big uplifting ending uh, that it is a big favorite. And uh, the other one that a lot of people know is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington again with Jimmy Stewart. Uh, major actor back in the 1940s and he is a small town I don't know if he's uh, uh, exactly what he is but somehow he gets appointed to the Senate somebody dies and he gets appointed to the Senate and he's supposed to be just a patsy he's supposed to just uh, be a puppet and do whatever the big shots tell him to do and vote the way they tell him to vote and all of that but he's he's very patriotic he has a mind of his own and uh, he stands up uh, to the bad guys and, uh, and uh, gives, um, uh, gives, a, uh, gives a very long speech, very moving speech, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Uh, and, and there's a couple of other ones, Mr. Deeds, John Doe, and so on. You kind of see a little bit of a trend in uh, the naming of some of these Capra films and so on. Okay, the one uh, that I would be showing in class and the one that I have so many links to, and of course you're welcome to search around, dig around, and you can find uh, some of the Capra films, uh, you know, some Mr. Smith stuff and some uh, 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 Wonderful Life stuff and so on. But the one I normally show in class is It Happened One Night. And 1934 and uh, with Clark Gable, so we're back to Gable, and that's Claudette Colbert, and they both won Oscars for their roles in this movie. The, the screenplay was uh, oscar and the director and the picture. So that's the first movie. Now, in 1934, Oscars were only six or seven years uh, in, uh, but it was the first movie to win those big five, and then it didn't happen again until the 1970s with um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, with Jack Nicholson. So it didn't happen uh, for another 40 years or so, 41, 42 years. Uh, and then it happened again with Silence of the Lambs. So it's only happened three times. Uh, other movies have won more Oscars, uh, including Lord of the Rings and Ben-Hur and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, only three have won what some people call the top five Oscars and I, I know there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of weight on the on the actor and actress uh, for sure I, I always consider cinematography and editing to be top Oscars that's kind of the essence of, of filmmaking really that cinematography and the, and the editing uh, but they're not famous people they're not movie stars so when the Oscars are on TV and when people talk about it usually they're talking about uh, the famous people So um, this is a story about a 
spoiled rich girl, okay? Claudette Colbert is a spoiled rich girl, and uh, we meet her on her father's yacht with a lot of uh, maids and butlers looking after her and catering to her every whim, and she wants to marry some guy. Uh, we barely meet him in the movie, of course. She wants to marry some guy, and she's she's uh, very pouty and all that, and her father won't let her. So she sneaks away and gets a ticket on a bus. And so here's this rich girl who's never been on public transportation before. She's never been on a bus or uh, or a subway uh, or anything anything public like that. Uh, it's based on a story in a, from a magazine called Night Bus, by the way. And uh, But It Happened One Night, I think, is a better title, that's for sure. And uh, so she meets this newspaper reporter, played by Clark Gable. And when we first meet him, he's, he's drunk. He's, he just got fired, and he's drunk, and telling off his boss and so on. But now he, he needs some money. And he gets on the bus, and he spots her, right? She, she's uh, been in the press a little bit that she's the runaway heiress. Where is the runaway heiress? And Gable's character spots her. I don't think anybody else on the bus does. One other guy on the bus does uh, later on, shapely. Uh, but um, he uh, sort of spots her and decides that he can... Uh, get his old job back and possibly a big fat raise by uh, writing the story of the runaway heiress, right? Some uh, up close and personal story of the runaway heiress uh, riding the public bus and all that sort of thing. We can see uh, the uh, we can see where this is going from a mile away. Uh, they're going to have to get together. They start off, of course, battling uh, and uh, and making uh, snide remarks. Uh, to each other and all of that, uh, but he comes to respect her and she comes to respect him and then love blossoms and all of that. There are some wonderful scenes uh, in the movie, right, riding the bus. There's one where a song bursts out, The Man on the Flying Trapeze. It's very nice and sort of seeing what Capra was so good at, the common, they always say the common man, they don't say the common woman, but you know, the, just the ordinary people all having a good old time on the bus. We're sort of all in this together and all that. Uh, there is a very famous hitchhiking scene, and uh, I've linked to that. Uh, that's the one we're looking at here, the, the, the slide picture. Uh, he's got a carrot. Uh, they've, they've left the bus, um, and, uh, and they're off. Uh, they're off uh, the, she's been spotted by, by somebody, so they're, so they're off, and they're going to hitchhike and so on, and he's got this wonderful technique for hitchhiking, and it's not going to work very well. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's another uh, wonderful scene called The Walls of Jericho, um, and that is where they're forced to spend uh, the night in a motel uh, as they're on the bus. The bus pulls over, it's a big rainstorm and all that. And uh, he registers as man and wife, an unmarried couple certainly wouldn't be allowed uh, to spend the night together in a motel. Uh, luckily for everyone, for the for the Hayes Code and for uh, the characters, uh, it's a it's a motel room with two beds in it. Um, and so uh, Gable's character uh, puts up a a, uh, a a rope like a like a clothesline between the two beds and hangs a blanket between between them. And he says that he likes his privacy. And she's just aghast that she would even be in the same room with a single man and all that, her being the rich, spoiled heiress, and so on. And he calls it Behold the Walls of Jericho. And uh, it's a wonderful scene. It's a really wonderful scene uh, between the two. Um, and, uh, and like I see, uh, there's a hitchhiking, uh, a hitchhiking, there's a piggyback, uh, how to define piggyback. It's just full of wonderful moments. Um, they all thought that it was kind of a minor film, Gable was a big star at MGM, and Louis B. Mayer was upset at him for something or another, and so he loaned him out, and they could do that back then. You would be under contract for five or seven years to whatever studio you were at, but the studio could loan you out to other studios for, for uh, cash. You would get paid 
uh, by the other studio, I, I assume. Um, but uh, it might not be uh, a movie that you wanted to make, um, but they could just trade you around like that, right? You're, you're going you're gonna to play a couple of games for that team for uh, a month or so, and then you're going to come back to our team. I mean, that's kind of what's going on, if you can imagine a sport, uh, a sporting team, something like that, basketball, football, baseball. You're going to go play for another team for a little while. So uh, Gable was loaned out to one of the minor studios, Columbia, pictures run by Harry Cohn and uh, and so that was really kind of a, uh, a step down for him uh, I'm sure uh, in the studio system he would have had uh, nice accommodations I don't know that they had trailers back then but I'm sure he would have expected uh, you know maybe a better uh, better accommodations um, I don't know about you know wardrobe and makeup and all that kind of stuff but it wasn't of a, uh, it wasn't of MGM's stature uh, Columbia and uh, Colbert. She, when she finished the movie, she said, "I just finished making a real turkey," um, and she didn't really enjoy the movie at all. I don't think she enjoyed uh, Clark Gable's company. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, what happens? Right? They both win Oscars for this this movie, not even at the major studio of MGM, uh, and so on. And uh, it becomes this very very famous movie. Nobody was really thinking very much of it at the time. But that's kind of the way the Oscars go, I think, a lot of times. I don't think anybody working on Parasite uh, last year was thinking uh, that it was going to be a big movie. First off, it wasn't even in English. It was in Korean. Um, and so a lot of movies uh, are made that are kind of a big surprise. Some of them, uh, I think people are thinking uh, that this movie, uh, like Gone with the Wind or... or um, um, big budget... Uh, big budget type movies, uh, things like that, The Sound of Music and, and, and so on. Uh, maybe they are Oscar contenders, um, but uh, there are lots and lots of little movies like It Happened One Night or Parasite and movies like that that sort of sneak in and, uh, and, uh, and pick up an arm load of Oscars. So enjoy the, uh, enjoy the clips and maybe dig around a little bit. So sticking with the uh, 1930s and the Depression, uh, we're going to jump a, a few years up to 1940 uh, with The Grapes of Wrath, based on John, John Steinbeck's novel, but it's set right in the middle of the Depression. And um, uh, during the Depression, people could be laid off from work, but farmers... Uh, really couldn't be laid off or anything like that. Farmers did, did, their, did their farm work. But what happened uh, to uh, a big chunk of the country around Oklahoma, parts of Texas, Arkansas, was uh, an ecological disaster called the Dust Bowl. And uh, a lot of farmers planted the wrong kinds of crops. They were advised by, I don't know, the government and so on to plant different, certain kinds of crops. Um, a lot of what crops do even after uh, the harvest is the roots are still there and they sort of hold the, the, the uh, dirt and, uh, in place, holds the earth together, you might say. And uh, big major windstorms came through the country, that chunk of the country, in, I think, 1934, 35, 36, somewhere in there. Big dust storms, big dust storms. And there was nothing to hold the dirt in place. And there would be just giant uh, tornadoes of dust. If you can imagine a tornado, which would normally be full of, of, of water and so on. Uh, and now there are these giant uh, dust storms. And uh, it, could, it, it could get everywhere. People would close up all their windows. Uh, people in that part of the country, they put all their dishes face down. Um, when they were uh, just storing them because uh, dust could get in everywhere and it could get into uh, their lungs as well. And some people got pretty sick uh, from uh, uh, lung disease and things, just like coal dust and certainly uh, cigarette smoke. But um, people could breathe that stuff in, infants, children. It was just really awful. Um, if you've seen the Christopher Nolan movie Interstellar, uh, and uh, the awful state that Earth is in at the time and why they need to go interstellar and all that. They took 
a lot of Interstellar from actual Dust Bowl interviews, and they uh, they based it on that. So when we see people being interviewed in Interstellar from a few just a few years ago, Matthew McConaughey uh, and uh, and directed by Christopher Nolan, they were basing that right directly on the Dust Bowl. So if you're a little curious what it was like, then uh, if you if you have seen Interstellar for sure, you would uh, you would understand. Um, and so um, a lot of people from Oklahoma, and they were called Okies. Not not uh, the worst thing you could be called, but it was still a derogatory sort of a term. Uh, not as bad as the N word or anything like that. Um, sort of like redneck or something. Sort of not really nice, but not really oh my god awful or anything like that. So. Uh, a derogatory term, and a number of Okies fleeing the Dust Bowl were uh, uh, lured out to California. There were flyers and advertisements and so on, come to California, uh, uh, great pick grapes, things like that, probably oranges and other things too, and uh, you'll get paid, uh, you know, 10 cents a bushel or 15 cents a bushel or something like that. So a lot of people from that area, uh, loaded up their their cars, these these rickety old you know trucks and things, old old Ford trucks and whatnot with with chairs and bedding and and, uh, and clothes and cookware and everything they had. It would just be loaded uh, sky high with uh, with everything they owned. Right? They would be evicted because they couldn't pay the rent on the farms. There were a lot of farmers who didn't own their farms. A lot of farmers were sharecroppers and they would in essence rent the land um, and pay the rent out of the money they made for their crops and then they'd have money to live on. Now, so that's the sharecropper life. They didn't, they didn't actually own the farms but sharecroppers life could go on for 50 years or longer. So a lot of people kind of felt like they were their farms uh, technically, a lot of people didn't own uh, their farms and couldn't pay the banks and so on. And even people that owned their farms, that they, they couldn't bring in any crops or anything like that. Uh, and if they still had to make uh, maybe uh, property tax payments on them or uh, you know paying off the loan that they used to buy the farm, they couldn't make those payments. So a lot of people lost their farms. They lost their farms and were desperate. And so this story from John Steinbeck about the Joad family uh, loading everything up. There's Ma there and Tom, played by Henry Fonda. And uh, they loaded up everything and they uh, head out to, to California, to the great Central Valley. They're, they're not going to Hollywood. They're not going to Southern California. They're going uh, to the great Central Valley to pick various crops and things, including grapes. And... Uh, they will meet nice people that will that will be very nice and friendly to them. Uh, there are various kinds of campsites uh, as they drive across the country, probably not more than about 20 or 30 miles an hour uh, in these uh, these heavily weighted down trucks and so on, trying to get over uh, the mountains. Uh, in one scene, we see people getting out and pushing uh, the, uh, the the truck. Uh, to get over a, a, a mountain pass or something like that. Uh, this is before the interstates, so they would be on Route 66. Uh, it's a historical highway, Route 66. You can see signs for it around. Uh, it starts in Chicago and dips down and through uh, Oklahoma and ends up in, I believe, Santa Monica. I believe it ends up in Santa Monica. You will see historic Route 66 road signs. Uh, around. Uh, I think it goes through like Riverside, places like that. Um, it parallels some of the interstates like uh, like um, uh, 10, like the 10 uh, for a while. It's a it's sort of a east-west road. But anyway, they ride on historical uh, Route 66 uh, trying to get over the mount mountains and all of that and then they head up into the Great Central Valley. Uh, some people are going to provide them with um, nice amenities, uh, possibly hot showers, uh, maybe uh, a dance night, maybe Saturday night as a dance night, something like that, some very nice 
sort of camp owners and things. The government's going to try to help out a bit, uh, but it's hard for the government to get into every corner of the country uh, and help out. And so some people are going to be kind of mean. The police are not seen as being particularly uh, helpful in this. Tom, uh, at the beginning of the movie, has uh, just gotten out of prison and uh, he was uh, in a brawl, right? He was in a brawl and I think uh, somebody got hurt pretty badly, if not accidentally killed. And uh, so he's, uh, he's out of prison when he finally finds his family. There's a wonderful scene, uh, kind of, uh, kind of in, the, in, the, in the dark, um, in the abandoned house. And uh, it's so nicely lit. It's so beautiful. And, uh, and uh, we see a, a man telling his story of, uh, of getting thrown off his, his property and so on. Uh, I'm not sure if I have that linked or not. I, I was looking for the normal clips that I show for this movie, and, and I, I was having a hard time finding uh, many scenes. So uh, I apologize if I don't have the link uh, to that particular scene, but it's very nice. It's only lit by candlelight, and the cinematographer who shot uh, this movie, uh, the next year he went on to work on Citizen Kane. So uh, very talented. Uh, Greg Tolan's the guy's name. And so this is a, a beautiful uh, looking film uh, in black and white. And uh, there are some scenes that evoke some very famous photographs uh, that were taken. Maybe you've seen this photograph. Um, actual Dust Bowl woman and her children. Um, she looks ancient, and I think she's like 28 or something like that, or 26 or something. Um, she just, boy, her face just looks weathered. Children don't even want to uh, look at the camera. And uh, there was a uh, uh, National... Recovery Administration, I think it is, something like that. I might have the, that acronym wrong for some reason. Um, but uh, the government of uh, Franklin Roosevelt had a uh, number of programs. Uh, OWPA, uh, uh, cross off NRA and write down NWPA. Uh, and I'll have to change it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's on the slide wrong. That, that should be WPA, Works Progress, Works Projects Administration. I think that's Works Projects Administration. WPA, not NRA. Uh, there was a National Recovery Administration, not the rifle, but National Recovery Administration as well. Anyway, Dorothea Lang was her name. Uh, she took that in California. She was about ready to uh, head home, and she saw that there was a migrant camp and got this photo. Uh, during the uh, 1930s, the, the federal government was trying to funnel as much money into uh, the economy as they could. Um, part of the reason that uh, the Democrats and Roosevelt got in was because they were going to uh, promise uh, for, the, for the government to help out. The previous administration, led by Herbert Hoover, thought that the government really needed to stay, stay out of it and that uh, industry could recover on its own. They had more of a hands-off uh, policy. Um, and they could have been right, um, but they didn't get the chance, and uh, they were voted out, and, uh, and Roosevelt came in, and so they put money into building uh, roads, they put money into building bridges and dams, and they knew that everybody uh, that needed jobs weren't really qualified for construction. Uh, so they put money into theater projects and arts projects, painting and that sort of thing, and and photography. And so uh, Dorothea was paid by the government, right? They didn't want uh, the artists uh, to, to be uh, 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 too much out of work and to be penniless as well. So there was lots of work for uh, construction, like I say, uh, bridges, dams, roads, all that, buildings, but there was also, uh, also work for photographers and people like that. And Dorothea Lang took that picture of this woman uh, in, like, near uh, Stockton, I think it was, something like that, in the Central Valley. So, back to, uh, back to the Grapes of Wrath. Uh, John Ford found people that look like that and shot scenes 
for the film that evoked some of these famous photographs that people uh, had seen at that time. So, produced by Daryl F. Zanuck, directed by John Ford, and he won four directing Oscars. One of them was The Grapes of Wrath, and it really is a, a gorgeous-looking movie. Uh, the night scene, scenes like this, the silhouettes walking across Tom on his way back home. And Henry Fonda uh, playing Tom Joad. And in a couple of years, uh, let me see, this is 1940, by 42, maybe 41 or 42, he's going to play something uh, exactly the opposite, a really rich guy in The Lady Eve. And we will talk about The Lady Eve when we get up to screwball comedy. Uh, and uh, he made The Lady Eve uh, for uh, Preston Sturgis, and he's going to play the heir to a uh, beer fortune and uh, a, a very clueless uh, rich guy. But here we see a very uh, committed and dedicated uh, poor Oki. So uh, Henry Fonda, father of Peter Fonda from uh, Easy Rider and Jane Fonda, uh, multiple Oscar winners, so uh, the Fonda family, and that's uh, Henry in this film here. Really is a nice film. Uh, you don't have to worry about writing down Greg Tolan, but uh, like I say, he went off to make Citizen Kane, so pretty good cinematographer, that's for sure. Okay, sticking with uh, this rough uh, period of the Depression, uh, we have I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang from 1932. Uh, this is from uh, Warner Brothers. And we get uh, Mer Mervyn Leroy, the director, but more importantly, we get the star, Paul Muni. And Paul Muni was the star of Scarface. Okay, so he was the star of Scarface. Uh, here we see him in I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. Uh, he tended to have a little bit more uh, non-gangster type stuff to do than, uh, than uh, Jimmy Cagney and Edward G. Robinson. And uh, he made, it, uh, made movies like this, and he uh, made movies playing famous people. Um, I don't know, he didn't play Alexander Graham Bell or, or Thomas Edison, but he tended to do a couple of biopics, uh, big sort of pres prestige uh, types of movies and things like that. And, uh, and this one, Fugitive, Fugitive from a Chain Gang. Um, it really is a dark look. Uh, at, it, it's at the Southern penal system, so it's not technically about the Depression, although it's set during the Depression and all that, but they don't really reference uh, the Depression in the film. Um, but the, the penal system, uh, he is, of course, innocent, uh, and we see that he's uh, uh, a veteran of World War I, and uh, it's based on a real story. A, a, a real person wrote the story, uh, a book, and so on, and uh, was uh, imprisoned unjustly in this in the movie version, and I suspect the book uh, as well. But he is on a uh, lumber crew, I believe. He's on a lumber crew, sort of wandering around the country, getting taking odd jobs and so on, and. Uh, one of the guys says, uh, you want to go to lunch? Lunch is on me. And he says, yeah, sure. So they, they, they go to a diner, and when it comes time for the bill, the other guy pulls a gun. Uh, and uh, Paul Muni's character has no idea this is going to happen. They get caught by the police, and he gets sent to prison. And he's going to work on a chain gang. In a chain gang, the men would all have their uh, uh, chain at the ankle. Okay, so, you know, you can't really, if, it, if it's tight around uh, above your ankle there, you, you know, right, right at your ankle, you can't really, unless you're going to chop off your foot, uh, you're not really going to get that chain off. They're chained together uh, with um, maybe, uh, maybe six feet of chain linking each man together with a chain around one of their ankles, uh, and that's how they're treated, and they work out in the hot sun, uh, busting rocks uh, for the most part, and uh, rocks have to get uh, busted down to gravel size so that they can make the road. So if they're out there with sledgehammers, busting rocks in the hot sun, as the song goes, I fought the law and the law won, busting rocks in the hot sun. And 
uh, and he gets beat uh, with the strap. And there we see the guy that's going to beat him with the strap uh, until he's uh, you know blistered and bloody for barely talking back, barely talking back. So he devises a plan to escape, and uh, while they're out on a, on a crew, he has been doing something to the chain around his ankle, uh, one of the links, I guess, around his ankle, and at that time he, he, uh, he uh, uh, wriggles out somehow and, uh, and runs, and of course the men with the bloodhounds are after him. They've got the guns, they've got bloodhounds barking off in the distance, and he uh, finds a water... Uh, uh, area, sort of a swampy area, and he cuts a reed and hides under the water and breathes through the reed uh, until the men and the dogs uh, pass by and he gets out and uh, heads up north. He's in the south somewhere. Georgia is where the book was set. I, I don't think they say anything in uh, the movie, but the book was set in the south in Georgia. He uh, goes up north, uh, presumably to Chicago or New York City, uh, and he leads a good life. Uh, uh, somebody takes him in, a young lady takes him in. He becomes a bridge builder, so he's very noble. He's doing public works and projects and all that kind of stuff. Very, very upstanding citizen, contributing to society, all of that. Uh, but the woman who took him in, she has romantic interest in him. Uh, he has found a different romantic uh, person, another woman, and he tells her that he, he that that's not to be. So she turns him in. She turns him in, and the, the, he gets a lawyer, and, and the, uh, the, the, the judge um, and, the, and the lawyers uh, do some negotiating, and the deal is that he will go back, uh, back down south to clear his record, um, the, the northern people are saying, why does he have to go back? My client has led a good life and so on, and, and uh, you know, um, he's served most of his time and all that. Why does he have to go back? And the, and the southern uh, uh, lawyers say, well, you know, it's just a technicality and he needs to go back. And just to do, uh, he, you know, he's got to do a minimum of, uh, you know, 30 days or something like that, and he'll just be a, a trustee of the warden and he'll keep track of stuff money or something. I don't know. You'll have an office job. So when he gets back south again, they say, you're the guy that escaped, and they treat him even worse than ever. And he says, well, I was promised that I wouldn't have to be out on the chain gang anymore, and I would be a trustee. And they laugh in his face. And of course, he has no way to contact his lawyers or anything like that. And now that he's in the hands of the Southern penal system yet again, uh, they are merciless uh, with him. And they... Uh, won't listen to his pleas of justice. He's, he's back in again. So, spoiler, he escapes again. This time he steals a truck uh, with another guy. They steal a truck, and they uh, while they're off on the chain gang, he manages to get away again. And then we just see some newspaper headlines. What happened to, uh, you know, John so-and-so? John so-and-so has been gone and never found, and whatever happened to. And now it's um, 18 months later, and his girlfriend from up north is walking along a dark street, and this voice out of the darkness says, Helen, Helen, over here, right? He's whispering, Helen, over here. And she goes over, and he comes out of the shadows, and and she says, oh, oh, my God, what happened? And you have to, uh, you have to, uh, you know, come back and talk to the, talk to the judge and, and all that. And she said, it was going to be different. He says, it is different. It is different. Uh, they chase me day and night. They chase me day and night. I have no idea where they are and, uh, and so on. And um, in this very dark scene, this has got to be the darkest ending of a movie ever. And... He backs off into the shadows so he can't see him again. And, he, and she says, how do you live? How do you work? How do you eat? And he whispers back to her, I steal. And then the movie's over. Yeah, really. And that's like in about not even an hour and a half. All that happens in a little less than an hour and a half. 
So anyway, a fantastic movie. Um, studios making 50, 60 movies a year could make something like that, right? They could make something like that. Um, and they wouldn't all be uh, escapist uh, musicals and westerns and fun movies and all that kind of stuff. They could make a dark, dark movie like that. And it really does stick with you. I'll, I'll tell you, it really does stick with you. Uh, so I'm a fugitive from a chain gang. Uh, really something. Not quite as dark, but kind of dark here. Wild Boys of the Road from 1933. Uh, William Wellman, we've Wild Bill, we've seen him. He did um, Public Enemy and, and a bunch of other movies. And this movie centers around some kids that are just out of high school. Uh, all their fathers, they're middle class, they're totally middle class. Uh, their fathers are out of work. And now that they're out of high school, they just figure that they are another hungry mouth to feed. Another hungry mouth to feed. Um, and so they decide they're going to go and ride the rails, right? They're going to they're going to hitchhike, basically hitchhike on trains, and uh, and we see a whole bunch of uh, other teenagers. I don't know the teenagers were known for uh, riding the rails like that, but of course in this movie it's <laughs> like nothing uh, but uh, uh, teenagers riding the rails, and they sort of bond together. They form uh, uh, camps together and so on till the till the Cops come and bust it all up and tell them to, to get out uh, and so on. And they get back on the trains and, and so on. The central character is this young guy right here. I can't remember his name, Tommy or something like that. This is a young uh, uh, girl. and um, But there are other girls out there, not so many. And, of course, she's got her hair up under her hat uh, and so on. Sort of for a little while, he's masquerading as uh, a young boy. And we're going to see in a screwball comedy... Uh, kind of a takeoff on that same thing uh, with Sullivan's Travels and a very pretty uh, young lady and she's going to tuck her hair up under a hat and sort of be like a young boy. Um, and uh, they're going to make friends with this other guy right here. And we see right here, he's got a crutch. He's got a crutch. And in a devastating scene, uh, they're uh, jumping off the train, right? The, before the train gets into the station, they have to... Uh, jump off uh, while the train's uh, slowing down, but they don't want to get into the rail yard uh, where the uh, where the trains have uh, people uh, with clubs, with bats and stuff, you know, trying to keep people from riding their trains for free. And he uh, and the boy in the middle there jumps off the train. He's going kind of fast, and he bangs his head into a a sign or a post or something like that and he falls down on the tracks and he's he's dazed he's dizzy he's trying to call, crawl off the tracks and he gets all the way off the tracks except for one of his legs and the train runs over one of his legs below the knee and so now he is uh, uh, on a crutch right he's only got one he's only got one leg and this is really tough stuff I tell you um, and, uh, and they're trying to find a, a prosthetic leg so he can walk around and, and, uh, one of the guys steals one, but it doesn't fit very well and all that. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, they are having a pretty rough go of it. At one point he thinks he, our main character thinks he's found a job and he's going to be able to earn some money and so kind of support his, his friends. Um, and, uh, a kindly judge uh, finds them. Uh, they, they're brought, they, they get picked up by the police, um, but they're young, they're teenagers, and uh, so they don't want to throw them in jail or anything like that, or just back out on the road again. And the judge says, uh, you know, uh, our country uh, really needs to get its act together. Uh, remember, this is 1933, so, you know, we're not looking back on the Depression, right? This is right in the middle of the Depression. And so the, the judge says, um, you know, we'll give you some money and, uh, you know, you really should go back to your family. And he says, no, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. My father's out of work. I'm just another hungry mouth to feed. Um, but uh, I think I know of a job and so on. So it ends kind of on a possibly upbeat note, but it's not like all of a sudden a magic wand, the depression's over or anything like that. So it doesn't have a particularly happy ending. 
um, he he thinks he has a job and he can help support his friends and and the movie kind of ends on this uh, kind of questionable uh, uh, area there. It's kind of questionable how they're going to do. Uh, again, uh, these are the kinds of movies that, that sometimes they were making. Again, most of the movies that people are going to see in the Depression would have been Escape, uh, whether uh, gangster movies, where the gangster sort of rises from the, the low uh, to uh, rich uh, kinds of guys, at least they're, 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 they're gangsters, but at least they're sort of uh, telling their own story and in charge of their situation. Lots of musicals. We're going to spend a whole class talking about musicals uh, coming up. Uh, and musicals, Fred Astaire and uh, Judy Garland and, and, uh, and Busby Berkeley musicals, uh, very much to escape uh, the Depression. But they made a couple of movies like Wild Boys of the Road and uh, Fugitive from a Chain Gang. There were a few movies that really did deal with it. Not a lot, but there were, there were these few. Okay, uh, we don't want to end on a really down note. Uh, so uh, we are still set in the, in the Depression, actually sort of just coming out of um, Prohibition. And that is The Thin Man. 1934, William Powell and Myrna Loy as Nick and Nora Charles. Uh, lots of money. We see her in big furs and and nice diamonds, and he's going to be wearing tuxedos and things like that. And it is uh, a detective story. So it's a detective story, and um, and uh, he is reluctant. Uh, uh, William Powell, Nick. Nick Charles is very reluctant. He jokes about marrying her for her money, and she laughs, right? She laughs. They are a fun couple, and they uh, have lots of witty banter, okay, based on the novel by Dashiell Hammett, who wrote The Maltese Falcon, so, right? So we're going to see him when we get to film noir uh, with Humphrey Bogart, uh, but for now we've got his movie of The Thin Man it takes place kind of at the tail end of the Depre of uh, Prohibition. And these guys are going to drink and drink all through the movie. Uh, I think I found a compilation of all of their drinking in the six film series. They made six films together. Uh, and they all have Thin Man in the title, After the Thin Man, uh, The Next Thin Man, Son of the Thin Man. I can't remember all the titles, but uh, The Thin Man Goes Home uh, and so on. Uh, and they're a lot of fun. Eventually, uh, they're going to have uh, a child together, Nick Jr. Uh, they have a dog, Asta, uh, wonderful, I don't know, Scotch Terrier or something like that, and, um, and does a little funny bits and things like that. And they solve crimes, right? So they solve crimes, murders, but mostly they, are, uh, they have witty banter and lots of drinking at one point. Uh, and the, early in the movie, she uh, she finds him in a in a like a nightclub. It's the middle of the afternoon. She finds him in a nightclub, and uh, uh, and uh, she's out walking. Asta and Asta drags her into the to the nightclub, um, and uh, she says, "How many uh, what? How many martinis have you had?" And he said, "This will be my sixth martini." And she says, uh, "Waiter." Bring me six martinis right here and line them up, you know, on the on the table. <laughs> so of course the next scene we see her with a a uh, hot water bottle bag on her on her forehead and what hit me and he says the sixth martini uh, and so on. Anyway, uh, lots of fun. What I love about this movie is that they're married, but there's no uh, there's no real conflict in their marriage. Um, there are scenes where there's a pretty young girl hugging Nick, and it's innocent, and we know that in the audience. We know it's, it's innocent. Um, but in, a, in every other TV show and every other comedy, she would take it the wrong way. That's just the way they, they do movies. There has to be a little bit of conflict. And in uh, this one, he just sticks his tongue out at Nora, and Nora sticks her tongue back out at him. And he explains that this is the daughter of the possible murder victim and so on. And so the movie's full of that sort of thing where they uh, are kind of making fun of each other um, and possibly in compromised positions and situations, but they 
they completely trust each other. She knows that he's faithful to her and she's faithful to him and all the whole rest of it. And so they just um, stick their tongues out at each other and, and so on and, and move ahead. Uh, this is my favorite Christmas movie. Most people don't think of this as a Christmas movie, uh, but then most people don't think of Die Hard as a Christmas movie either. Uh, but it takes place in the Christmas season. There's a wonderful Christmas party in this movie. I just love it with all his weird friends, and lots of people uh, out from prison and things like that. Uh, one guy uh, says, uh, Nick sent me up the river, and up the river would be where Ossining Prison is, what was called Sing Sing. Uh, and so Sing Sing was the prison that would be referenced in movies, uh, New York uh, gangsters and that sort of thing. And uh, the guy is at the party. He's been invited to the party after after Nick uh, sent him up the river, and uh, and Nora's meeting him. And the guy, he's good natured about the whole thing, and he says, "Well, I needed a rest. <laughs> I needed a rest, or I needed the rest." So again, he doesn't bear any ill will to Nick. Nick caught him fair and square, and he did. Well, I don't know, six months, a year in prison. It wasn't something awful. We didn't, we never know what it is actually. Uh, so it's that kind of a movie. It's just a lot of fun. It puts a, a, a real smile on my face, that's for sure. Uh, there were six films in the series. The first one uh, is fantastic. Like I say, it takes place at Christmas time. Uh, Christmas morning uh, is a uh, wonderful, hilarious, fun scene. I watch it. Even if I don't watch the whole movie, I watch uh, Nick and Nora Charles' Christmas morning scene uh, every, every Christmas myself. That's my Christmas tradition. So, uh, there we go, some more uh, depression stuff. Try to end, uh, begin uh, with some fun uh, pre-code stuff with uh, uh, Gene, Harlow, and Clark Gable, Red Dust, uh, out there in uh, Vietnam. Uh, Culver City, of course, they didn't go on location to do that movie. Uh, but beginning with a little pre-code and, uh, and ending uh, with The Thin Man, uh, with a little bit of dark stuff uh, between between Grapes of Wrath and Fugitive from a Chain Gang and Wild Boys of the Road, and then uh, trying to end a little bit on, a, on an up note. So um, that's it for today. Uh, thank you so much. I will post uh, uh, next week's, uh, hopefully about a day or so early uh, for you. So please uh, stay caught up and watch all of the links to the movies, and I will see you next time.